from a defabricated solar-powered garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA. This is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, tips on having that awkward conversation with Grandma about her addiction to audio erotica. And now, the podcast host who probably doesn't care about such things because he's all about those angry customer videos, Pete Dominic. Oh, yes, I am. And I'm always all about you, too. Pete Co., you weird son of a bitch. Thank you very much for another hilarious, bizarre opening. We don't know where you get it. But we love that you bring it, and I missed you not being here. That's Pete Coe. He is a contributor to the show almost every day, as is John Carroll, who writes this song, the transition music, and pretty much everything I use here music-wise at this point, although there have been many contributors. If you'd like to contribute to the program, let me know. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. And thank you to everybody who sent me feedback and messages in many different formats. On yesterday's show with Dr. Eli Merritt, all about mental health, the messages were so, so nice. Rosalind Simmons, I really enjoyed the show. Dr. Merritt was a great guest to talk about mental health and grief. I love the open and honest conversation between the two of you. I think you help a lot of listeners talking about your struggles. And then she went on to talk about her own, which was really interesting. I heard from Brady out in Arkansas, which was really nice, who said he also recently connected with another listener and creator himself, Maddie Carlson, to talk about some issues that they had in common, which was really great. Phil Round emailed me and said, Dr. Eli Merritt, today's show was one of your best. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Phil. That's very kind. Dan McKeever. I hope your week is off on the right foot. I just want to send you a quick note to tell you how much I enjoyed your great interview with Dr. Eli Merritt. I loved everything about your chat, and I was delighted that you got into stoicism, which I've recently been reading a lot about. Yeah, there's some good podcasts out there on stoicism as well. If you want to learn more, Dan and everybody else, I like that format. I got a very nice message from John Carroll. Vicky reached out, and so did so many others, and I wish I could just mention everybody, but just a handful of them, and I'm sure they'll keep coming as more people listen to that conversation, and that's why I read all that positive feedback, because I hope you do go listen to my conversation with Dr. Eli Merritt, who joined me yesterday, and I hope to do a segment similar to that every week. We're going to call it the mental health episode, so stay tuned for more, and give me your ideas and who you've heard that you think would be great. Hey! Maybe it's you. Joining me on today's show, I've got David Rothkopf and Michael Cohen. Great conversations with both of them. If you want to skip this opening segment covering some of yesterday's news, you can start my conversation with David Rothkopf at 16 minutes into the pod. And then you can listen to my conversation with Michael Cohen. That begins at the 55 minute mark. But first, let's talk about what happened yesterday. The big story, of course, Buffalo Bills DeMar Hamlin has been fully cleared for football activities. The guy who collapsed, everybody thought he was dead. He can play football again. Isn't that great? No, that's not the big story. I'm I'm joking. No, it's that southwestern U.S. rivers are getting a boost from winter snowpack. So that's really great news. Isn't that great, huh? National Weather Service delivering good news for cities and farmers who depend on two major rivers in the southeastern U.S. No, that's that's not the story I'm talking about. Well, here's another one. First black chief judge for New York State has been confirmed. New York Senate confirmed Rowan Wilson as the state's first black chief judge. Isn't that good news? No, that's not what I'm talking about. Maybe it was this one. Netflix is poised to shut down the DVD by mail rental service that set the stage for its trailblazing video streaming service in an era that began a quarter century ago when delivering discs through the mail was considered a revolutionary concept. No, that's not it either. Of course, the big news story I'm talking about is that Fox News settled a defamation suit for $787 million with Dominion voting systems, which accused Fox News of pushing conspiracies that harmed the company. Of course, you've heard all about it at this point, but here is some of the reactions and analysis that I heard across the media spectrum yesterday that I collected for you. First, here's Chris Hayes on his show on MSNBC last night. 
So the bottom line here is that on the first day of this trial, much anticipated, Fox News has agreed to pay Dominion voting systems a truly ungodly amount of money for one reason. Why? Why? Why did they strike this deal today? They desperately wanted to keep their people, including Fox Corporation Chairman Rupert Murdoch, who is slated to testify as soon as tomorrow, and host Tucker Carlson and Maria Bartiromo and Sean Hannity from having to go under oath. They didn't want their executives or their hosts admitting in sworn testimony what they did, that they knowingly and repeatedly pushed one of the most dangerous falsehoods in American history. A little bit from Chris Hayes on his show last night. He also welcomed uh, New York Times columnist, the brilliant Michelle Goldberg on. Here was her takeaway. Well, look, I think that it is not shocking, but it is disappointing because people, you know, there's been so much evidence already unveiled through the course of this process about the just utter cynicism and contempt with which Fox News treated its audience and its kind of journalistic responsibilities. But there was a hope that a lot more would come out. And to be honest, I was really um, curious about how Fox was possibly going to defend itself because the judge had really shut off every avenue of argumentation that you could imagine Fox News making, right? They were going to try to argue that they were just reporting on newsworthy allegations by the president and his attorney, but the judge had said that they can't do that. The judge had basically already ruled that Fox News aired um, defamatory falsehoods. The only thing they were arguing about was whether in airing those defamatory falsehoods, um, Fox News had risen to the standard of actual malice. All right. That's a little analysis from Michelle Goldberg. And we also heard from Harry Enten, who I love this guy's legal perspective, Always love to hear from him. Here he is as well on MSNBC last night. Look, you can't quibble with Mr. Shackelford that this was in their self-interest, but this was one of the very, very rare cases in uh, sort of our social history in which the public interest dovetailed so much with the (laughs) private interest. And the table was really set for Fox to have to admit and for there to be vivid evidence, overwhelming evidence that Fox misled the American people, that it contributed to the big lie, really having that conclusively established. What we have now is inconclusive. It's just not quite right that money is accountability. It's a big check for them, and that's their, that's absolutely their right to do. Their damages case was maybe weak. But I think this could have, it promised to be so much more as a sort of public event, social history. Now it will not be that. Okay, there you go. There's a couple of reactions there. Also over on Twitter. Matt Goldberg writes, I'm not sure that if this trial would have crippled Fox News, but I do feel a bit silly for thinking that a company like Dominion had any higher aspiration than their own bottom line. Ali Mistal tweets, I completely get why Dominion made this settlement, and if I were their lawyer, I probably would have told them to take the money. But I'm not their lawyer, and so I can also recognize that this is a cop-out and why, once again, we should never expect corporations to save us. Also, I think the reason this is so disappointing is that Dominion gets $787.5 million, but we, the people who supported them over the lies and misinformation spread by Fox, get nothing. I'd feel better if I got a cut. Instead, I just get more of Tucker Carlson's smirking face. Greg Sargent says, look, it would be great if Fox personalities were required to issue mea culpas on air for their relentless line, but stop letting Fox bamboozle you into presenting this settlement as some kind of win for them on those narrow grounds. It isn't. He's always brilliant over at uh, the Washington Post. My friend Allison Gill at Mueller, she wrote on Twitter, writes, it is possible to both understand the Dominion settlement and be disappointed by it. It was nice to think for a little while that corporations would help citizens preserve democracy. If anyone, quote, learned a lesson today, it was us. And I asked both of my guests about this today, but I edited most of it out because it was no longer relevant. We were speculating and talked before the news broke in the afternoon. But Michael Cohen did tweet Dominion exposed Fox's hypocrisy for the world to see and got them to pay nearly eight hundred million dollars. And people are complaining they should have gotten to gone to trial and try to get more. People on this website done lost their minds. I guess people had some pipe dream that this trial would put Fox out of business. Hate to break it to you, but their viewers don't care. Being lied to is why they watch Fox in the first place. And David Rothkopf tweeted in reaction to it. 
Nothing that is broken in our system got fixed today. That is the only meaningful metric of the Fox Dominion settlement. We seem increasingly incapable of righting wrongs, reversing attacks, reducing threats. It's not that we never see victories for our people. It's that those who are attacking our values, the rule of law, who seek to assert minority rule, are institutionalizing their power, disabling our checks and balances. It's a dangerous moment. And so that's David Rothkopf and Michael Cohen's reactions to it. Both of them joined me, and we talked about several other issues as well that I think you're really going to like and learn a lot from hearing their thoughts on things. Always love both these guys. And I stayed up late for you last night to try to get some of the reactions from comedians on this to share with you. First, here's Jordan Klepper. He's hosting The Daily Show this week. The clip starts with Jake Tapper, and then you hear Jordan Klepper come in. A lawyer for Dominion announced that Fox would be paying Dominion $787,500,000. Wow. Wow. $787 million. That is a ton of money. And Fox was already strapped for cash. Tucker Carlson can only afford one facial expression. <laughs> and look, I'm glad there's some accountability here, but still... I'm pretty disappointed we're not going to get a trial because all the Fox anchors would have been forced to testify. It would have been like the Seinfeld finale. But instead of (laughs) instead of soup Nazis, it's just (laughs) regular Nazis. Nazis. Since Fox is going to have to pay nearly a billion dollars, they'll need to implement cost cutting measures. Sadly, they have to fire Brian Kilmeade's reading tutor. Janine Pirro has to switch to the cheap box of wine. Uh, <laughs> development on a third Ducey has been halted. <laughs> they're going to have to switch from Jesse Waters to Tap Waters. And, uh, <laughs> of course, they're going to have to put down Sean Hannity. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. All right. And Stephen Colbert had a lot of fun on the CBS Late Show last night, of course. Uh, oh, I know one company that's going to have a big old tax write off next year because about two hours ago, Fox News settled their defamation suit with Dominion Voting Systems, averting a trial. Damn it. I want my trial. I want it. You were supposed to provide me six weeks of delicious content. I wanted to see Rupert Murdoch put his hand on the Bible and burst into flames. According to Dominion, the settlement was for a gargantuan $787.5 million. That's a lot of Dominion. (laughs) Admittedly, Rupert Murdoch is losing his shirt here, but nobody wanted to see that. I got some bad news. I got some bad news, folks, because reportedly Fox News will not have to acknowledge on air that it told lies about Dominion in the wake of the 2020 election. Boo what they said. Boo, boo, sir. Boo, I say. I guess it's satisfying. I mean, for Dominion, that Rupee had to fork over a pile of cash, but that does nothing for our democracy. What we need is Fox News personalities who look straight into the camera, admit that they lied over and over again about the 2020 election. (laughs) And then hurl themselves into Mount Doom. (laughs) Fox was Fox was quick to release a statement, semi acknowledging that something kind of sort of maybe happened. It said. You know what? I'll I'll let our friend Jake Tapper attempt to read it. This settlement reflects Fox's continued commitment to the highest journalistic standards. We are hopeful that our just sorry. Oh, don't don't apologize, Jake. It's hilarious. All right, Colbert and the Late Show over at CBS, they all might be on a writer's strike soon. And I certainly hope that isn't the case because uh, great stuff from uh, both of those shows. And of course, I stand to lose a lot of money if John Oliver goes dark. So that would suck because I work on that show most Saturday nights. All right, I'll probably talk more about the writer's strike at some point this week with uh, a writer. How about that? Or next week, most likely. Well, now let's get to my guests. Again, thank you so much for all of your feedback on yesterday's show. Hope you'll go listen to that. I'll be doing more of the mental health programming. Let me know who you want to hear. 
I hope to see you tomorrow night at our stand-up weekly happy hour hangout. That's at 8 p.m. East, and if you're a paid subscriber, you'll be getting an email with that link. Always great to see folks there. And coming up, my conversation with Michael Cohen. We caught up yesterday, talked about his latest at Truth and Consequences. Always a great conversation with Michael. But first, it's David Rothkopf, who has quickly become one of your favorite guests for me to talk to here on the show. He is a journalist, an author. He hosts Deep State Radio Podcast, which is really, really good. He's a foreign policy, national security, political affairs commentator, expert. He worked at the Clinton administration at the uh, Commerce Department, I believe it is. Member of the USA Today Board of Contributors, author of 10 books, including American Resistance, the inside story of how the deep state saved the nation. Of course, read him at the Daily Beast. You should follow him on Twitter at DJ Rothkopf. Like I said, uh, go subscribe to Deep State Radio. And I think that's enough. That's enough of an intro. Let's do it right now. David Rothkopf. How was your Passover? Did you have a good family get together? What did you do? Um, nah, uh, no. Oh, no. Nothing special? Nothing special. Just the usual. But my wife is not Jewish, but she loves matzah and constantly is saying, we need more Jewish crackers. That's... <laughs> I like I, I like her. She sounds awesome. Uh, Jewish crackers. Had you ever heard yeah. them called that matzah? Called that before you met your wife? No, I I did That's not. Great. Now I can hardly think of them as anything else. <laughs> well, I have a lot to talk with you about. I'm very happy to have you joining me here today, sir. Uh, plenty to discuss, of course. First and foremost, it seems like a pretty big story. I want to ask you about the the Fox News Dominion lawsuit. Are you how big of a story is this? Fox can afford the one point two billion dollars. Um, I mean, technically, the you know the, the penalty could be higher, but but they could afford that. Um, and I think all along they felt that that's a potential cost of doing business. You know, you may recall that during the two thousand eight two thousand nine financial crisis. Places like Jay Morgan with multi-billion dollar fines because of the way they handled the mortgage market. And they just paid them. And, you know, that's that's a, one of the many ways in which our legal system offers effective impunity to the wealthy. You can afford a lawyer, if you can afford the fine or you can afford the penalty, then there is no penalty. You can just move ahead. And while we're talking about the legal system and certainly in a related subject, uh, your thoughts on the latest regarding the former disgraced president who is now most likely going to be the nominee and his legal problems that he's so far in so far. Well, you know, I, I know everybody says he's most likely to be the nominee. And if you look at the polls, you know, his lead over DeSantis is growing because DeSantis is a vile little turd. And, you know, it's and, and it, you know, he's not ready for prime time and Mickey Mouse is kicking the shit out of him. And, <laughs> you know, it's just that, you know, he's not going anywhere. But we haven't seen the legal system do its thing with Donald Trump yet. And, you know, we, we, we can imagine now what's going on with New York. But what if six months from now there are four indictments plus two civil matters, you know, Trump is in court all the time, 24-7, there are new revelations about abuse and crime. And then he does what he, he normally does in those circumstances. He either freaks out or he freaks out and he lies a lot. And maybe he lies under oath. Maybe he commits other crimes. You know, th th this is a very, very tricky situation. And to just think, well, Trump's always gotten away with it before he's going to get away with it again. I don't know that I, I agree with that. And so, you know, at, you know, at that point, it could be anybody. You could be the, dem the Republican nominee. It'll be either me or Pompeo. Yeah, it's a pity Pompeo dropped out. And I, I think up to 50 percent of his family was really upset by the news. <laughs> well, hold on. You know, isn't the question how many Trump voters are there 
who believe the only way to free him of all of these investigations is to elect him president so he can pardon himself or somehow be absolved. I mean, that's got to be a pretty strong constituency of voters. A big yeah, block. May, I mean, maybe and it may be within the Republican Party. It's it's a fraction of a fraction. You know, even now, Donald Trump, the dominant force in the Republican Party, gets about 50 percent in these polls, uh, which means half the Republican Party is willing to support somebody else. You know, two percent of the Republicans are like, Tim Scott is the man for me. And and, you know, that's a sign that, you know, this this party is in some distress. If this continues forward, even if half the Republican Party, and I don't think it's that much, a third of the Republican Party really believes they have to get Trump back in in order to restore his good name, that may matter in the primaries. It's not going to matter in the general election. I mean, Joe Biden must literally just must be sitting there going, I'm the luckiest man on earth. I have come to run for president against the most dysfunctional political party in American history. I can't imagine that in 1846, the Whigs were (laughs) worse run than the Republican Party is today. Speaking of two more questions about the Republican Party as it relates to the House of Representatives. So they brought a I haven't seen them ever go on location, a House investigative committee. I, I don't they don't usually even like I don't know, you think they might they go investigate the BP pipeline. So they go and go down there or something. They come to New York because Donald Trump apparently told them you better do something about this. So they came to New York to uh go after Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan DA, and and, and the 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 whole idea was crime in New York City. You lived in New York for a long time. Uh I go there all the time, lived there for a long time. And what do you make of those Republicans uh, having the going on the road and, 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 and this doing the bidding of Donald Trump? What, what does that say about them? Look, I'd love to be able to offer some subtle political analysis here. But the reality <laughs> is Jim Jordan's an idiot. Yeah. And a lot of these Republicans are idiots. And they go there and they say idiotic things about Alvin Bragg and about crime in New York City. And on some level, you know, they either know that what they're doing is lying or they are too stupid to do the basic research that is required to do this. Because as everybody said on every news channel, crime is down in New York, not up. It's down in Manhattan. It's not up. It's higher in Columbus, Ohio, where Jim Jordan is from. The murder rate is higher in Columbus, Ohio. It's higher across the country. The crime problem we've got is a wave of gun deaths that have become the number one cause of death among children in the United States. It's not Alvin Bragg. And a year ago, Alvin Bragg didn't bring this case. You know, Alvin Bragg decided it wasn't ready. And all of these people were complimenting him for his wise decision. Uh, You know, at one point, they were going to have this guy Pomerantz, who worked for Alvin Bragg, come in and testify to their committee. But I was thinking, wait a minute, Pomerantz is the guy that wanted to indict Trump a year ago. You know, is that really going to work out the way they want it to bring this guy in there? It was foolish. The Democrats on the committee made them look foolish. The Republicans on the committee made themselves look foolish. It achieved nothing. And, you know, we're 100 days into the Republican control of the House. This happened earlier this week. They haven't done a damn thing. Well, also, they're up against this debt ceiling issue, which more and more Americans will pay attention to. (laughs) Kevin McCarthy came to New York City. He went downtown. He was at the exchanges. He was on CNBC and he was. Try, it looks like he got the shit kicked out of him down there. I mean, and that's only going to get worse on the debt ceiling issue. You can't well, of, course, the- of course, he's going to get the shit kicked out of him, because what he's saying is, let's not agree to meet our obligations. And, you know, the, the this is not about spending that is going to take place. This is about spending that already took place. This is about a debt 
that grew, I, I might add, almost exclusively under Republican presidents. Yeah. And uh, this is about a debt ceiling that he, McCarthy, and the Republican Party had no problem ri- raising several times during the Trump presidency. It's a political stunt, but it's a political stunt that's playing with the full faith and credit of the United States. And, you know, it would deeply shock markets and not just, you know, if he goes up to the edge of the abyss, but forever after, because right. people will say, you know, this this is uh, not a trustworthy country anymore. And, you know, uh, just as a as a as a as a point on that, you know, when Ma- Macron came back from Beijing and he was talking about. You know, we have to, France, Europe has to chart an independent course from the United States. Um, the, you know, they need strategic autonomy, as he put it. One of the main reasons he, and the, their argument is the United States is not reliable anymore. That Trump could come back or that a Trump like right. president could come back and behave in an irresponsible way. And certainly if we blow it on honoring our debts, that's just going to compound that. And, you know, it's not like, oh, own goal, you know, that's, you know, it's too bad. It's we're now in a in a in a global situation where the Chinese and their allies seek to take advantage of every single weakness that we present mm. so that if we piss off a country, they'll be there tomorrow offering them a better deal. Is that right? Yeah, well, and, and but that's the way well, I do. I do feel like an example of that was during the Trump administration, they started a trade war and all of a sudden American soybean growers lost a market and the Chinese and I think the Brazilians stepped in and were like, we'll buy, we'll sell. Uh, and it I don't I don't I never really followed up on that. I don't know. I, I heard at the time experts were saying they would close them out for the rest of Maybe they're their lies, but they lost a lot. It sounds like that's kind of what you're talking about. Well, that, I mean, that's a, I mean, that's the markets at work. The Brazilians and the Argentines and, and soy and stepped in and started supplying the Chinese and other other countries are, are doing that. But I'm just saying that we can't afford to sort of assume global leadership. <laughs> we, we, we've got to work for it every day. Yeah. And we, we, we can't be an irresponsible leader or others will step up. We're not, you know, guaranteed forever to be the global, the sole global superpower, which most of us think we are. You know, most people sitting at home listening to this are going, no, no, that's what we've well, always been. Well, you generally, I think it's human nature to think you are the thing you've always been. Yeah. And when, you know, particularly since the end of the Cold War, it's so 30, one years now, we you know we there hasn't been another superpower right. at least in our in our own imaginations. But that's over. I mean, that period is over. How dare you? Come I'm on, this ter- program. I'm terribly sorry. I think the U.S. could do very well in a competition with the Chinese. I think the U.S. All things being equal, would win a competition with you know the Chinese if we don't do stupid shit. And, you know, do it following the Kevin McCarthy financial approach, uh, you know, following Donald Trump foreign policy. Uh, but it's hard you know. not to do stupid shit in a democracy where people are fighting all the time. It's a lot easier for China and other authoritarian states to be more nimble and streamline entire industries. Meanwhile, we're arguing over, you know, the most ridiculous <laughs> I mean, yes and no, right? I mean, it, it's it's it, it may seem easier to have a, a authoritarian government, but it doesn't make you more competitive because there's no competition. There's no, you know, search for the best idea. There's no, you know, there's none of the entrepreneurial secret sauce that makes us successful as a country. But, you know, we we are at a moment where we have one political party that is so obsessed with maintaining minorities' control over the United States that they will trash everything else to do it. Yes. The and Constitution, com- the rule of law, our standing in the world. And, 
you know, it's scary as shit because they've just stopped caring about the law. In uh, Idaho, if you're uh, pregnant, you want to get an abortion, you can't leave the state. Completely unconstitutional. But they're like, we don't care. We're, you know, this is this is the way we're going to play our game. Try and enforce it. How are they going to know that if somebody leaves the state to get an abortion? Well, how are they going to know? But what about the 80 percent or 60 percent or 30 percent of people who don't do it because they're afraid? You know, they're they're in, in Tennessee and in other states, they're passing what they call Second Amendment sanctuary laws that say gun control laws don't apply here. Yeah. Federal law doesn't apply. We're going to honor our own law here. Constitutional? Heck no. But they're going to continue to do it. And because I feel of- bad, by the way, I feel I should say when I flippantly said, how are they going to know if you leave the state to get an abortion? The point should be you shouldn't have to be afraid. And I think I disregarded <laughs> that, that, like, you know, you don't want to think you're breaking the law. Well, that's right. And then you get some crazy ass judge yeah. in Texas who lied to get the job. At, which, by the way, seems to be a big thing among right wing judges. Mm. And he says, I'm going to get rid of the abortion pill for the whole country. Crazy. And you know why I'm going to do it? I'm going to do it because there are some I'm going to give standing legal standing to a bunch of doctors because they argue that performing these abortions could make them upset. I mean, it's. It's legal, legal cloud cuckoo land, but it's the law until the Supreme Court says it isn't. And look at the Supreme Court. Look at Clarence yeah. Thomas. Yeah. Look at Kavanaugh. Look at, you know, I mean, Alito doesn't care about the law. So, you know, we, we're we're in we're in some deep water. And, and you know, if we lose in the global competition, it's going to be because of self-inflicted wounds. Right. And getting back to the global competition, you just wrote a piece about that uh, vis-a-vis China. But, you know, well, not only you, you basically the, talking about the whole world and you talked, but you talked a lot about China in terms of what the future looks like. America must fight to save its superpower status. You touched on that. But talk to me a little bit more about what this looks like in the in the well, near future. Well, I mean- I mean, first of all, you know, the editors use the term fight. I specifically, I, w- I would probably not use the term fight. We must compete, right? I mean, fighting implies Got military. It. And there's a heavy focus on military, but there's not enough focus on the other stuff. The other stuff is, you know, going out there and, and having a pitch to the world that says, our system is better. Sticking with us is better than sticking with them. We will treat you better as a creditor than they will treat you. Working with our capital markets is better for you than working with them. Our values are better. Yes, we push for democracy. Yes, we push for human rights. But ultimately, that produces stability. That's the side of the world's leading nation. You know, but we have to make that case. And that's the point. The point is, we have just assumed it. You know, you know, and and there are plenty of people who are going around in podcast land uh, and in, you know, pundit land who are going, China is evil. And everybody's like, OK, China is evil. And then that's it. And the world will understand China is evil. Well, but no, you know, there are a lot of people out there who go, hey, those guys will write me a big check. And they're not going to harangue me about, you know, the way I run my country. Right. And they're growing fast. And why shouldn't they lead? They're, they're, they have the most people of any country in the world, or at least they did until last week. Right. When India just. In, India edged past them. But, you know, I mean, the, you know, there are plenty of places in the world that are a little bit tired of U.S. domination. Wouldn't we? It wouldn't. The American currency, the dollar wouldn't. Isn't that the canary in the coal mine? Don't you watch that? Isn't the fact that it's the currency of the. The world depends upon oil barrel, all of that. Doesn't that matter more than so many other things? And isn't that a signal for if things were? I think I think that it's super important. But, you know, that by the same token, you know, we have the biggest, most liquid capital markets in the world. That's right. a huge advantage. 
Uh, we have a remarkable entrepreneurial culture and a corporate infrastructure for creating businesses, but also letting businesses to fail. That's a huge advantage. We have a global network of alliances, huge advantage that we've got. Uh, we have a, you know, a university system in this country that is the best in the world to train people, still is, despite the existence of Liberty University and a few of the other places out there. <laughs> Ron DeSantis was just there. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I saw, I, I saw that. And despite what Ron DeSantis is trying to do to colleges and universities in Florida, saying, you know, you can't teach anything that might make one parent of one student uncomfortable. I mean, you know, um, so we have a lot of advantages, but we could yeah. blow them. You yeah. know, that's that's the key. Uh, I wanted to get your I wanted to get you wound up a little bit, as I like to, and I'm, I'll lead you to the water here, see where I'm going. But this uh, this young man, he's a 21-year-old airman, and he somehow had access to highly classified materials, and he leaked them on a video game platform, Discord chat and everything. You know, people know what happened. And then Marjorie Taylor Greene came to his defense and said he was being targeted because he was white Christian and st I think she said straight. And I thought you, I thought you want, I want to give you an opportunity to react to her comments about uh, defending this young airman. Well, she's actually, you know, defending Russia. She's defending China. She's defending our enemies. You know, this is what she does. She's saying treason's okay. If you have the same beliefs, I do. It's part of the whole Republican belief system, which is if you're white, Christian, right wing, anti abortion, pro guns, go ahead, commit a crime. We'll defend you. If you're the president or you're this little twerp in this, you know, this uh, chat room. And there were a lot of other Republicans that reflexively defended this guy because they surmised correctly that he was a right wing nut in a right-wing chat room that did anti-Semitic rants and racist rants, you know, with, with his, with his gaming buddies, you know, I, I, I mean, clearly, I mean, you've seen pictures of this guy. Yeah. Um, he, he clearly was spending too much time indoors online. <laughs> he did right? not look like he had seen the sun or a weight room. <laughs> he, he did not look like a health. I mean, truly he looked like, he was, as I think somebody said on late night the other night, but he he looked like a kid playing dress up in a military uniform. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't fill it up. You know, we shouldn't we shouldn't pick on the way he looks. I don't know. Maybe we should. But I mean, but the he was a vile human being. Yeah. And he betrayed his country. And, you know, he was in an intelligence unit. Trust me, most of the training he had in this intelligence unit was don't do this shit, right? Don't share this shit. And I, you know, I, I, I have long said, and I have friends who don't go as far as me in this, but we have too much classified information. We share it with too many people. Yeah. We make it too easy to get out there. We've got to dial it back, classify less, share it less. You know, last year, I think there were 70 million documents classified in the United States, each of which has to be stored in a certain way, can't be shared in a certain way, and so forth. Uh, that's a huge cost, and it's ridiculous since the vast majority of information in those documents is available someplace else in unclassified form. Hmm. Do you think we spy too much? Do you think we should spy less on our friends? I I don't know about that. I mean, everybody spies on each other and it's, it's everybody bad. spies on everybody else. And, you know, it gets embarrassing when we spy on our friends. But, you know, some of our friends do disturbing things. You know, I mean, as these documents showed, the Egyptians were, you know, who we've been literally we connected them directly to the U.S. Treasury, been pumping money into Egypt for for decades. And, you know, they had a thought in their head for a while which we managed to, I think, persuade them contrary. But they had a thought in their head that they were going to go and sell a bunch of advanced weapons to Russia to help them in Ukraine. 
You know, so, you know, now if we hadn't been spying on them, would we have known that? No. It enabled us to go and step in and persuade them to do it a different way. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, it's, I, I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. Let me just get back one more time to the Republican Party, because I feel like I saw you share this tweet and I was some questions about your thoughts on it. What happened in Tennessee was wonderful. I mean, not the shooting that was an atrocity, as horrifying shooting, but the reaction to the shooting was a bunch of young people came out and, and the people that they'd elected who happened to be, you know, community organizers, these two black guys, they, uh, got their megaphones and they went up to the, and they, they halted the whole hearings and people got mad at them and then they threw them out and then they raised a ton of money and they became famous and we started listening to them and then they had to bring them back in. So it was like a huge own goal. And it was, it was but they still control the, the legislature there. Uh, this was just more of that Republican sense of impunity. They can do whatever they want. The rules of the road don't matter. Precedent doesn't matter. Fairness doesn't matter. Decency doesn't matter. I, you know, I think the bigger issue here remains the issue of guns. Yeah. Uh, I listened to the speech of the woman who was part of that NSC three when she didn't get voted out. Right. And essentially the speech was my daddy was a gun owner. I come from a family of gun owners. I own a gun. Owning a gun is a good thing. But, you know, doing some common sense gun reforms makes sense. And uh, yeah, I mean, should, but she didn't, you know, she was not saying we should ban assault weapons. She was not saying that we should take any of the, the, the larger steps that we should be taking. Yeah. They're not going to do that. We're not going to do that anywhere in the United States. There are 400 million guns in a country with 350 million people. 200 million of which are owned by 3% of the people. I mean, think, you know, wrap your brain that around right? I've never that. heard that stat. Yeah, go, we'll look it up. It's, it, it's, it's, a, uh, I, I, it, it's a stat that dates back a couple of years, but it's still probably roughly accurate. And that's essentially saying that there are 10 million Americans who own 200 million guns, right? These people are crazy. and. You know, I'll say something that will permanently alienate me to all of your listeners. But this is the 21st century. Nobody has any reason to have a gun. Nobody. You don't need it to hunt. You shouldn't hunt. It's a disgusting thing to do. You don't need it to protect yourself. If you're not in the military or the police, you don't need a gun. And there is no right to have a gun. The Second Amendment says, you know, in order to enable there to be well-regulated militias, none of these people are in well-regulated militias. Uh, the guns are completely different uh, breed of cat from what the guns were in the 18th century. Um, and uh, we have gone to a point of national psychosis over guns that will lead to the deaths of more people, you know, each year than roughly were lost in the course of the Vietnam War, 10 times, 20 times, 12 times as many as were lost in the Middle Eastern Wars. We've lost more people to guns in the past couple of decades than we've lost in every war we've ever fought. Okay. And yet we're having a discussion about, well, look, what is some incremental Thing that we can do. And then we don't even do that. You know, every other civilized country in the world has a different approach and they don't have this problem. It's insane. It would be like, you know, if you have a kid in your house and every week he burns down your house because he's an arsonist and, you know, you go, well, you know, uh, you know, the house shouldn't be so flammable, you know, instead of saying, Let's not give the kid fucking matches. <laughs> well, it's just a lot. It's quite an extreme thing to say. Nobody should have a gun, especially coming from you. There's several rifles behind you. Uh, how do you explain? There are no, there are no rifles. How do you explain me? an arsenal that there, you're There are no weapons in my house. 
Uh, I have never had a gun. When my dad died, he had a pistol that he had. had a, he took, you know, he got in World War. He got in World War II from a German, dead German. And my mother said, well, you're the oldest. You can have the pistol. And I was like, I don't want a pistol. I don't want a gun. I don't think people should have guns. And, you know, in Japan, if you own a gun, you know what they do? They say, fine, we'll keep it for you here at the police station. If you would like to go hunting, come to the police station, fill out the form, take your gun, go hunting, and then bring it back here. In, in England, the police don't even have guns except for a select few of them. Uh, the, I feel these, like every black person listening is like, yeah, imagine that. I go sign my gun out of the police station. They're like, oh, man, your gun isn't here anymore, Eric. Sorry. Well, look, I mean, you know, our police stations are, guns. that's another, it's an, it's yeah. another problem. No, I understand you're explaining the, uh, the, the, but, the rules. But, but, the law. No, no, but it's just, it, you know, go look at the, 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 the 20 leading OECD countries in the yeah. world. They don't have the problem. You said, uh, hunting is disgusting as a strong opinion. Uh, and I wonder not if you're a deer. I wonder if you eat animals and if you're a hypocrite, because I was once making, I went off on a guy on live radio who's a hunter and I just, all the things I grew up around hunters. They walked through my backyard for goodness sake. A lot of my friends are hunters. And I said, it's just wrong to kill a defenseless animal like that with your gun. And I, I made probably similar arguments. And then the guy's like, do you eat meat? And I was like, yeah. So I felt like he had a better argument. If you kill and eat your own animal, you probably have, you have more integrity than me eating, you know, the, the chicken, the Caesar chicken. Well, for, first of all, that's not true okay. because the animal that you're eating is going to be dead anyway. So killing an additional animal does not mm. make you better morally on a higher ground okay. than eating the ones that are being raised to be killed. Secondly, I try not to eat much meat. I don't, I don't eat much meat. But the point is that raising cattle, which is terrible for the environment, we shouldn't do it. And I suspect we'll do much less of it in years to come. Or raising sheep doesn't lead little children to be killed in schools, right? So, like, let's just not conflate these two things. You know, the, the fact that people say, well, I'm a sportsman. And that's why I need this weapon of war that fires 400 rounds a minute yeah. and could tear, you know, what, it, what, can you imagine if an AR 15, um, uh, a bullet, uh, I don't know, hits a pheasant. I mean, you'd be lucky to find a feather. I just want to say one thing. You seem really upset and I want you to know that I am a sportsman, but not like regarding guns. I don't have any guns. P P pickleball. You like all sports. Yeah, I love sports. I'm good at most but sports. But none of my sports involve using an implement that somebody can go in and kill children how, how, in an elementary how school. How do you with. feel? You're, it's really hard to make any jokes after you say that. There it goes. I was just going to ask you about yeah. how you feel about bow hunting, but now it just, you ended with dead children. So it's like the bit really doesn't go. Bo, I don't, I mean, look, I, I'm, I don't think. Hunting is a good thing to do. I don't think it's humane. I don't think it's necessary. I think we hunted once when we had to hunt, and we don't have to hunt now. Your specific family, the Rothkopfs, did. Pardon me. You said we hunted. No, people, people hunted. Uh, my family was hunted. You know, my, but yeah, my, but you know, you know, we were like running from Cossacks. I'm okay? not laughing. No, no, that's not funny. But, um, you know, we, we were we were running from Cossacks. But it, anyway. Um, you make not you make all great points. I tried to make some counterpoints for people out there listening, but I pretty much completely agree with your thoughts on on guns, although I do like shooting guns. It's fun. I've had a lot of fun doing that. Like I go to friends, friends of mine have guns and we shoot them. I went to summer camp. I got my marksman first class button, you know, a little pin shooting at 22 at a target. Um, seemed like a kind of a cool, fun thing to do at the yeah. time. Yeah. But it, we now have a society that is dying in big numbers of this 
you know, hobby. I would, so, so, I, you know, so like, let's, let's not have it. And the, the ones that are like, well, we need this, this uh, weapon to protect us from the government. This is the stupidest argument. Oh, why? Do, do you think that you with your AR-15 are going to defend yourself against the United States military? Well, I have several of them. Yeah. Well, that'll be good. The, the, several of them will be found with your cold, dead body. I, I mean, you know, this is the United States Just my States dead military. body and a bunch of shiny guns filled with ammunition. Right. But, you know, this is the U.S. military. You're not going to, oh, yeah, we're going to protect ourselves. You mean like you did at Waco and Ruby Ridge. Right. Sure. You know, and, and that pissed you off. I You didn't really think the government should go in and go after people posing a threat. To the to the to the to the public, uh, you know, give me a break. I will give you a break. I'll let you go. Sorry, I've I've pissed you off, and the NRA will not sponsor your podcast anymore. Did you see those photos of all those kids holding guns at the convention? Yes, it was, it, it was hideous. Like a little eight year old pointing a gun at the camera. I mean, you know? just just seeing all those people in that room and knowing. Mike Pence went up there and they, and they all, all the candidates went and paid fealty and there's a whole convention and like all those people, I kind of want to go and put a microphone out and just see what happens. But, 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 you know, what about this disgusting habit, which has come back to bite them in the ass each time of these members of Congress standing around with their families and the Christmas tree holding, you know, assault rifles yeah. You know, 50 caliber, long distance sniper, right? You know, whatever they're holding. And by the way, and, you know, the wife always seems to have a pink AR-15. Yeah. I mean, what? It, you know, it makes like, you think about how, like, if that's their Christmas photo, it makes you think about the, the rest of their parenting scenarios that we've all been in. Like your kid does something wrong or is is feeling down or upset. What is dad? What kind of dad are you in that? situation you come in their room that you you're wearing the gun <laughs> but i mean this is just it's it's insane yeah and then these people go no this is showing my you know this is my right as an american right although that's just not true nobody ever thought that was your right as an american right you know you have to have a license to go fishing you have to have a license to have a a, a drive a car you know, you pay taxes on uh, alcohol because it's it's not good for you. And we don't do any of this. To, you know, we, we should tax ammunition so that nobody could afford it. We should have people have to have licenses that are renewed, you know, uh, on a on a regular basis and have much higher standards. Uh, and and we should start buying back the guns. You know, Australia did it. You can buy yeah, them back. Work, they, they always they they're always successful those gun buybacks. I mean, people always want the money for their their gun that's just sitting around. Oftentimes, you know, your husband or boyfriend died or something. Maybe even Jesus of that gun, and then they go sell the gun. You know, I mean, people do want to get rid of them. By the way, you mentioned shooting a twenty two and you're younger. Like I'd settle for making laws around the caliber. You could stop your home invader with a twenty two. You don't need a fucking grenade or a an assault weapon. Yeah, I mean. But these people probably have boxes of grenades in their house. I mean, you know, it's they are they are a serious problem, and they they're like you know out of my cold dead end. Will you? And it's like, really, that that's it? Okay, you know, I, it just everybody wants to be reasonable and incremental, and the reality is that when everybody's doing something unreasonable. The reasonable thing is for them to stop. Your mix of exasperation and ability to articulate yourself speaks for so many of us. And I am very grateful to you for joining me and for all of that. Thank you. I loved it. Well, I'm very grateful to it. see you. And I now must go get my wife from the post office because our 90 pound dog has apparently decided that's as far as he wants to go. And he refuses to walk home. I thought you had people for that, but get on yeah. top of it. Good luck. I hope we get 
it caught on <laughs> surveillance camera. And, by people for that. Yeah. All right, buddy, thank you very much. All right. Well, the hunters in this listening audience are going to be pretty, uh, pretty worked up. Ty Randolph, what do you have to say about that? But I love David Rothkopf and mostly agree with him, frankly, on, on all that stuff around guns. Go let him know that you enjoy his appearances here on this podcast. He almost always says yes, makes himself available, and I love our conversations and our rapport and our and our burgeoning friendship. At DJ Rothkop, go hit him up on Twitter. Get his book, American Resistance, and listen to his great podcast, uh, Empire Podcast, over at Deep State Radio. Okay. Well, now it's time to get to my second guest of the show. He runs one of my favorite columns, Substacks, truthandcons.substack.com. He's a former Boston Globe columnist, former employee speechwriter at the State Department. He's been a professor at Columbia. He's an all-around super smart guy who I certainly don't always agree with, but I do love talking to about, well, everything. He's become a good friend of mine as well, and he's great still on Twitter if you're still on there, at SpeechBoy71. Subscribe to his Substack, and our conversation begins with me referring to the Dominion Fox News case. Again, the news hadn't broken yet that they settled, but I still think that Michael's response here is actually relevant to what did happen. So we start right there, smack in the middle of that question. Here we go. Do you think that this case... As it plays out, as the public hears it, at least the audio, I guess we're going to get to hear of Tucker Carlson being asked why he said one thing in a text message and another thing on TV or anyone else in a similar. Do you think, as some people are saying, that it will damage the credibility of Fox News? (laughs) Sorry, you use the word credibility of Fox News in the same sentence and I can't help but laugh at that. No, I don't, actually. Um, I think that. People who watch Fox News believe they're bullshit, for lack of a better term. And I think that they will find some way to compartmentalize whatever bad news stories about Fox are out there, uh, the way they compartmentalize all the bad stuff we find out about Donald Trump. So I don't think it has a huge impact. I mean, I think what will be interesting is if Fox is sort of is required somehow to apologize on air to their viewers. I think that would be kind of interesting. Um, but Look, I think the best solution is if Fox goes out of business. I doubt that's going to happen because of this other $1.6 billion, which is what the mean is them for, is a lot of money. I think Fox can actually afford that. Yeah. Ideally, they'd go out of business because they are they are a propaganda organization, not a news organization. And I, by the way, for the record, they have a real news side of actual journalists. And I don't understand how they continue to work for this company. I really yeah. don't get it because it is, if, if you have any kind of journalistic ethics at all what they've done is appalling Well, because you're not going to get a job anywhere else that's why i don't think that's true i mean chris wallace went to msnbc that's, I mean, people a, have fucked that's news. an exce- you, okay you can name three people but you're talking about the journalists that are still there they're going to have I'll a hard someone, time I'll, I'll get someone like jackie heinrich who who is a is a white house reporter for fox news i i see some of her stuff on on twitter she doesn't seem overly biased she seems to be a straight news reporter um you know there was a story that Tara Carlson and Hannity wanted her to be fired because she fact, fact checks something they said about the 2020 election. I, I'm sure she'd get a job somewhere else. I'm sure she could. And I would frankly, love to talk more about that later. Uh, but I think once you get a job at a certain place in a certain corporate media company and you're getting a huge paycheck, it's it's hard to think that you'll make a parallel move, much less a better one. There could be some exceptions. Let me ask you, though, about some of these other things that you've been writing about that are really important. I want to get your take on young man is 21 years old, he's in the Air National Guard, and he has access to highly classified information that is very, to say the least, disruptive in our relationships with some of our friends and certainly enemies. And that's my big question, and I want to know what your concerns are, just that he has access. I mean, this is a kid who apparently gets off on watching Kid Rock shoot Bud Light, you know, beer cases, that kind of dude, that's his, that's where he's at in life. And he's got access to these files. I I don't have as much of an issue with that uh, Hmm. because, well, let's put it this way. I don't know if he should have or should not have had access to these files. I just don't know. Uh, He was in the intelligence branch of the Massachusetts Air National Guard, which I I assume provided him access to certain intelligence material. If he was, if he had a clearance to see it, he could see it. When I used to be in, at, at, in government, I had security clearance. I could see certain documents that I didn't really even need for my job. 
but I had the clearance level so I could access them. But I, I guess my take on this is, is a little different. I, I just feel like this reminds me of the Snowden case from a couple of years ago when people were defending Edward Snowden. And I sort of made the argument he shouldn't be defended because it was highly illegal and put a lot of Americans overseas, including non-Americans, in danger, which it did. And he violated a certain a trust, which is that when you get a classified designation, you get tossed your clearance, you're expected to abide by the law. I, I know I did when I had a tossed your clearance. And when you have that clearance, it is drilled in your head over and over again of how important it is to secure classified material and that you can pay a serious personal price right. if you screw that up. And so that's why the laws punishing people who turn over classified material or you know leak it are so severe to deter people from doing this. Because you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in the, in the military, in the bureaucracy have security clearances. And you know the expectation is when you have this, you're not going to leak this information. And if you do, you're going to pay a price for it. Right. And so from that perspective, I, I sort of hope that, I mean, 21 year old kid is obviously an idiot, but <laughs> you know, this stuff is not, is not excusable. You can't do this. And if you do it, you, you know, you can put people's lives in danger. You can put American foreign policy in danger. And this guy, just like Snowden, doesn't have the knowledge or the ability to know what is OK to be leaked and what's not OK to be leaked. And so I suppose I kind of hope he pays a price for this. But as far as why is access to it, I, that, I don't know that. I just think that a lot of people, you might be surprised, have access to classified material, but few of them actually leak it because they understand that there's a price to be paid for doing so. And this kid obviously yeah. did not appreciate that. Let me now move to your friend Clarence Thomas. Yeah, my good friend Clarence Thomas. You write, <clears throat> you write over at truthandcons.substack.com under the title Supreme Corruption. You say the original pro publica story on Clarence Thomas' relationship with a billionaire conservative donor was bad, but this is even worse. Again, more with the great Holland Crow. Holland Crow's company has put just a string of properties on a quiet residential street in Savannah, Georgia. And apparently those properties were Clarence Thomas's old home. It's, why is this worse wow. than what we found out earlier? And what do you say about Clarence? We've learned so much about this guy in the last year. But, you know, have we? I mean, we have. But we knew that he was a bad guy. I mean, we knew that he lied in the Anita Hill hearings. We knew for years that he didn't reveal, for example, his wife's salary from the Heritage Foundation on his disclosure for the Supreme Court. Until and then he was called on and he did reveal it, which makes the claims now that he like was an oversight somehow just sound like bullshit because there's a pattern of behavior of Thomas just not disclosing information. The thing with this particular story, you have a guy who's donated ten million dollars, I think, maybe more, to get a more conservative Supreme Court, and he is buying the home uh, appears above market value. Clarence Thomas's mother, renovating it for $36,000 and allowing her to live there rent free. Um, that is corruption. If that isn't corruption, then I don't know what is. Because, you know, you could say, well, Crow doesn't have any cases for the Supreme Court. First of all, we don't know that. But that isn't the point. The point is, he has do donated millions of dollars to create a court in the, mo in, in the, image of Clarence Thomas in the image right. of the far right in this country. Right. And now he's providing favors to one of those judges. Does it influence Thomas decision making? I doubt it. Does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. What matters is that Thomas has a basic, basic ethical responsibility to disclose that he's receiving money from a donor who is giving millions of dollars to turn the court more rightward. I forget the second part, just to, to, to admit that, to say that he's done this. We have disclosure rules in, in, in the federal government. When I worked at State Department, again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep referencing my time. No, I like in, it. In I, I like it. We used to go to this rice place, <laughs> this rice, Asian rice place right near State Department. And it was, it was a hell, hole in the wall, but it was really good. And I, a friend took me out there to lunch once and wanted to pay for it. And I said, I know I can't let you pay for it, even though he didn't. He was I think he had some relationship to foreign policy work. I was like, I can't you can't do it. It's 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 uh, I'm not even going to risk it. That's for a, a lousy ten dollar lunch at a hole in the wall rice place. Yes. This guy's taken 
uh, half a million dollar trips to the New Zealand and the Far East and, and you know, the um, uh, Polynesian Island and not and not it revealing it. It just th- shows, I think, sense of entitlement and sense that the rules just don't apply to them. There was a column written, I think, at The Atlantic basically arguing, no, you're not a Nazi if you just collect Nazi stuff. Uh, do you have a short answer for that? It's not the most important thing, but I, I feel you like... You might not be a Nazi, but you're definitely a fucking weirdo. I mean, I think that is a... that's a, it, The guy had a statue of Mao in his backyard. Hmm. Mao. And Stalin, and Ceausescu, and Che Guevara. And Lenin. That's weird. Anybody can acknowledge that's weird. I don't know if the guy's a Nazi. I kind of doubt he's a Nazi. He's creepy AF. I'll say that. I will say that. All right. Uh, Let me ask you about your most recent piece. There's more in the, all the news that's fit to comment on. I hope you'll continue to do that. But your piece is the 2024 Republican presidential nomination race already over. Not yet, but the trajectory of the race is increasingly clear. You write now, Michael, what is your, First of all, your opinion on talking about the horse race or the presidential campaign at this point. What are you what are your thoughts about us doing that? You wrote this piece. I I'm interested in it. I want to talk about it a bit. So what are your thoughts in general at this point? Listen, I write about politics for a living. And so I write about the horse race. It's it's part of what I do. Um, you know, you can get the substance of Republican policy views. I also write about, too. Um, elsewhere or or on my I newsletter. I do write about that as well. But the horse race stuff is important and it gives us a sense of where the race is headed. And from my perspective, and I've been saying this for months now, I think Trump is almost certainly going to be the 2024 Republican presidential nominee. I could be wrong. I, I certainly have been wrong before. I'll be wrong again. But if you look at where the race stands right now, it's kind of hard to see a scenario where she loses. And, and there's there are two reasons for this. One is he is extremely popular among Republicans. OK, he's got about a 30 to 40 percent of the party who will vote for him no matter what he does. He shoots somebody on Fifth Avenue. He could shoot 100 people on Fifth Avenue. They still vote mm-hmm. for him. Uh, you've got. But then you've got and then you've seen since he was indicted, his numbers have actually gotten better, which tells you a lot about the modern Republican Party. But the interesting thing is that there's no one who really can challenge him right. now. DeSantis was the one who everyone thought, well, this is the guy who might be able to take him on. He, his campaign so far has been a dumpster fire. Uh, and I mean that I don't like DeSantis at all. I don't well, you just said his, his campaign. Now, he certainly hasn't announced. He yeah, just yeah. got reelected. He hasn't even announced yet. Yeah, that's yeah. actually true. Yeah. He hasn't announced it yet. But, but you say it so flippantly, and I think you're absolutely right, because he, even the most... I mean, there are ads right now. There's an ad, an anti-Trump ad uh, that I, I I don't know. Maybe it wasn't. He doesn't have a campaign, uh, I guess, a super PAC or something. And then there's an anti-DeSantis ad, which is they're both pretty brutal. But go ahead. The, anti- the anti-DeSantis ad is is really brutal of him. Cause there's a, a story a few weeks ago about him eating, eating pudding with his hands on a, on a plane. Yeah. And so. So Trump people use that as the, in the ad, which but the bigger part of the ad was they attacked him for for his previous support for cuts to Social Security and Medicare, which is, uh, you know, people don't realize people forget this. But in 2016, you know, uh, Trump ran against the Republican Party and ran against Paul Ryan and ran against the, the push for cuts in entitlement programs. So this is not a new thing for Trump to run on. And uh, he's just sort of bringing out the greatest hits on 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 DeSantis. But. So you're right. He hasn't announced his campaign yet, but everything he's done up to the, la- over the last couple of weeks has been pretty ham handed. And so a couple of things happened this week. One was the pudding ad, which was brutal. And I think just shows you. But I think it's, it, it's in- indicative of the challenge he's up against in going after Trump, because, first of all, Trump is, has no problem attacking him, obviously. But DeSantis has shown no inclination whatsoever to attack Trump. He won't even criticize him by name. So with, with that in mind, I don't really understand how he thinks he's going to beat him if he can't even, can't even challenge him. Um, and, in, and in a Republican Party dominated by sort of alpha male views, you know, you got to show you can, you can actually throw a punch. And he, he, he and he'll only throws a punch at liberals, which a lot of, a lot of conservatives like. But uh, in comparison to Trump, he looks weak. It's a really, um, good, it's a really great point in, in, a, in a party dominated by this kind of masculine toughness. If you're not able yeah. to to be a dick. Which is why 
I thought Pompeo would have been the best candidate. I still think he's going to be the nominee because I've committed to that, even though he announced he was not going to be running. I still, I think, I think as you write in your piece, I'll be the first to acknowledge that you can only glean so much from polls this early in a nomination fight. There's more than a reasonable chance that more criminal indictments will be levied on Trump, which might give GOP voters pause when they actually have to cast a ballot. That's why I think Pompeo will come back. But talk to me about Tim Scott and Nikki Haley, who both have raised a good amount of money because you write about them as well. Well, let me just finish playing this sentence. I think it's important, actually. OK, so sorry. His whole strategy has been to say, I'm I am just like Trump, but I'm more electable. Right. I'm the guy who can win. And then this week he signs or last week, a six week abortion ban, which is going to be political kryptonite in a place like Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania. So he's screwed himself in that respect. Um, And also you've got major Republican donors who are basically saying this guy's too extreme to get elected. Yeah, that's the problem. And that under if he if people think he's too extreme to get elected, it undercuts his entire strategy. Now, you mentioned Scott and Haley. I wrote a piece a few weeks ago about Haley where I said, I'm going to write one piece about Nikki Haley. That's going to be it for the rest of the the, mm-hmm. the campaign. I'd like to adhere to that because she's not an impressive figure. She doesn't have a constituency in the party. She recently was outed for lying uh, in her in her financial disclosures yeah, you, how much money she raised. Yeah, you she make a big point. A why is that a big – I don't understand why that's – I know I'm sure there's a reason for it. But you write about that and you say she said – that she raised like 11 or 12 million. She only raised like eight or 9 million. Why does that matter so much? It makes her look shady. I mean, she, it's an embarrassing story for her. She lied about, or she misled about how much money she'd raised. That's never good. Like, you know, right now we are in what's called the shadow campaign, right? Voters are not paying attention to this campaign right now. They really aren't, which is why you should largely ignore the polls. I mean, not largely ignore them, but like the head to head polls, for example, I wouldn't take too seriously. So what matters really is how journalists sort of perceive you and how they and how they, mm. they t- write about you. It's how donors perceive you. It's how sort of major power brokers in the party perceive you. This is an embarrassing story for Haley that makes her look shady. So I think it's hurt. I think it's harmful for her. Look, DeSantis has had the same problem as well. And then you mentioned Tim Scott. Tim Scott announced that he's going to run. I actually thought Tim Scott would be a strong candidate because you know nothing conservatives love more than to vote for a black man to prove they're not really racist. Right. So I think he, I think he has a real, would have a real opportunity, but he gets asked twice about abortion and offers these just, ugh, mealy mouthed, unintelligible, ridiculous answers, refuses to answer the question whether he supports a 15 week abortion ban. And just, you know, in all honesty, I shouldn't say this, but it's true. I think for a lot of political journalists who cover this stuff and they see something like that, they kind of immediately write somebody like that off. I, I'm really serious about it. I think you see that and you say, this guy's not ready for prime time. That was my thought when I saw it. And I think a lot of political people won't admit this, but they'll, they, they, their image of him is maintained by that. And that will affect how they cover him or how seriously they take him as a candidate. So I think both Haley and Scott have kind of screwed themselves a little bit. Haley less so because the, the Thunder's story is not as big a deal, I think, as the abortion screw up by Scott. Because it really just shows Scott is not ready for prime time. But neither one of them, the pro- but every other problem that they have is as long as DeSantis is in the race, the lane of not Trump again, which is what DeSantis, he leads in that lane, is occupied and they can't pass him. And so I don't see how they're going to build up the name recognition and the donor support. Like she was $8 billion, which is not bad, but that's not enough money to compete with DeSantis and Trump. She needs a lot more money than that. So I, I, I think that both of them, if they can't raise more money and if they're still viewed as single percentage candidates they won't really get a breakout and it, so DeSantis, it'll be between DeSantis and trump which i think is i think DeSantis is a bad candidate and i think that he is a bad strategy and i think he's so far he's not acquitted himself well i mean I think this long to announce he's running has been a disaster a real disaster um and i actually wouldn't be shocked if he doesn't run at all in fact i think it's a reasonable chance he doesn't run at all i, I if i were if i were advising him not to run um what I, you- I think i think he's Mistake. Would you advise RFK Jr. not to run? I would advise that guy to. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I'd advise him to do. He's an what? idiot. And Just- I, I, it, I'm not going to. I, I refuse to talk about him or Marianne Williamson. They're not even serious candidates. They're, Joe, they're, Joe Manchin they're, may be considering a run. He's not going to be president. No way. Last question I want to ask you is about the 
issue of abortion and gun violence, are they hmm. starting, you can, I'm sure, take them separately, having a really major effect on the potential election outcomes this this uh, this this time around next year, this year? That's a great question, actually. That's a really great question. And the way I would answer that is yes and no. In other words, no, not directly. Uh, well, that's not true. You know, I wrote a piece about this recently about the abor- politics of abortion. And, and one thing you saw in 2022, and, and if you can go up to the Supreme Court race in Wisconsin a few weeks ago, is that when abortion's on the ballot, it's really good for Democrats, right? So, you know, Wisconsin Supreme Court race, Supreme Court judge, she basically ran saying, I'm going to overturn the law in, in Wisconsin that bans abortion. She won by 11 points, which is a pretty big margin in Wisconsin. Um, Kansas had a referendum, a constitutional amendment. It was it was rejected by a pretty sizable margin. Uh, Kentucky had a referendum as well. In Michigan, abortion on the ballot, and Democrats just swept the table. But in other places, Florida, Georgia, Texas, where people generally speaking are pro-choice, didn't really help Democrats all that much. So there is a there's a ceiling, I'd say, to how much abortion can can help Democrats, how much of a factor it is. The thing is, the problem for Republicans is that it's a factor in like three or four states that are the most important states in the 2024 right. election. Well, yes. So Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. Yes. But here's the thing. Keep in mind, this is something to keep in mind. Just just put this in put this in your head for a second. I mean, in Pennsylvania, abortion played a role in the governor's race, I think, because Josh Shapiro ran, who's the Democratic governor now, ran on the issue. His opponent, Doug Mastrano, was stridently anti-abortion. And if Mastrano won, considering that Republicans controlled the state legislature, it would have meant that abortion probably would have become illegal in Pennsylvania. Mm. So you could make a direct connection between voting for Shapiro and your views on abortion. But I don't know that people will make that connection in a presidential campaign. And go back to Wisconsin, for example. Tony Evers, Democratic governor, won re-election by like, you know, four or five points, maybe, maybe a little less than that. Um, but Ron Johnson, who's stridently anti-abortion, he did get it. He won. He won his Senate race. He won re-election. So I'm not convinced that part that using abortion override partisanship. Where I think it helps Democrats is it probably motivates a good number of Democratic voters. So in a state that leans blue like Pennsylvania, it probably helps right. to mobilize voters. Does right. it switch voters? I'm not so sure about that. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I think voters need to see a direct connection between their vote and how it affects abortion. Look, in Florida, a majority of Floridians uh, support abortion rights. I mean, it stands by 19 points. You know, I mean, so, no, I, I just think that People should be careful with that. Now, you asked about gun control. Yeah. Here's where I think it does matter. The, the cons- Republicans have taken these very extreme positions on abortion and gun control. Very extreme positions that are way outside the mainstream, especially on gun control, by the way. I mean, on gun control, they are way outside the mainstream. And in these swing states, well, let me step back. By, by taking those positions, they've sort of passed themselves as extreme candidates. It's a cumulative effect of the anti-trans stuff, the, uh, the pro-gun stuff, the anti-abortion stuff. Um, the, ele- the democracy, the election, the election stuff, all of that put together has put a, an image of Republicans that, are, that, is, that is not positive. And so if you have a candidate who kind of has all those views or some of those views, they, they are affected by that negatively. You saw that over and over in the 2022 midterms. So I think that's where it hurts Republicans. And that's where it's not so much the issue itself in a, in a, in a vacuum, because on gun control, there's very few, I don't, I don't think any examples really of a Republican losing because they're using gun control. But I think it is a kind of issues, the sort of compendium of issues that mobilizes Democrats and brands the GOP as extremists. But again, some states more than others. Remember after Uvalde, everyone said oh, people are going to vote against Greg Abbott because he's a big you know, pro-gun guy. Yeah. He won by 11 points in the governor's race. Didn't affect it at all. So, But I, I do think, so in Texas, it's not going to matter. Florida probably won't matter. But in those key swing states, I think it does matter. And that's where I think it, it plays Democrats' advantage. So the thing I'd say is if the nominee is Trump, or I mean, if DeSantis, he's so extreme in so many of these cultural war issues, like guns, just signed a yeah. uh, concealed carry law that allows you to carry a gun without a permit, on abortion, on the trans stuff. All of those things, I think, would hurt him in a swing state. For Trump, what hurts him is that he's Trump. People like Trump. And, and, and we saw that in 2020, saw in 2022. So I just think that they, their problem is that they are, they don't have anybody who can sort of weasel their way out of that that image that they have right now as extremist party. 
was the Ari Machine Party. That's uh, an understatement. There are a lot of things. Uh, I really appreciate your thoughtful, nuanced analysis, as always. But thank you very, very much, Michael Cohen, for joining me. Always a pleasure, Pete. Thank you. All right, well, there you go. That's the show. How about it? Took a lot of time to put this baby together, as it does every day. So from booking the guests to prepping for them to interviewing them to editing the interviews to editing the whole podcast together every night and then getting it up, posting it up so you can download it in the morning. So much to do, including your pictures, your vitamin N pictures for subscribers. If you haven't sent me a nature photo, get out there. Now is the time of year and send them in. We need them from all over the country and you'll get them in a daily email, which I usually send out actually between 10 and midnight uh, and if I if I get the podcast done by then. So subscribe now at patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or standupwithpete.com. And of course, give a rating and review to the podcast. That matters a whole bunch. Everybody always says that, but do you ever do it? Please do it for me. Thank you. All right. Well, I look forward to talking to you again tomorrow where I will have yet another guest for my Generation Z series. I'm very excited to introduce you to the very impressive 33-year-old Amy Chase, who is the daughter of a very good friend of mine, Steve Chase, who you might have heard me talk about. He's been on the show. He's my mentor in all things environmentalism and sustainability, and I will have that for you on the Thursday show. Tonight, actually Wednesday night, I'm in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. How about that? Keep me company. I'm out there doing a gig at Penn State Du Bois talking a little sustainability and environmentalism with young folks, something I do from time to time. I'd like to do a lot more of, as a matter of fact, but excited to be doing that. Hopefully I get out there and back safely, and you'll enjoy my conversation with Amy Chase on the Generation Z show tomorrow. All right, I'm done talking. That's it. Thank you, John Carroll. Thank you, Pete Coe. Thanks, everybody, for listening and supporting the show, which I'm trying to end with a positive quote, inspiring or motivational quote, something that makes you happy here at the end. So feel free to send me one, Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. But here it is. This is uh, Steve Jobs, who said, Your time is limited. So don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dog, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. I like that a lot. Huh. Thanks, Steve Jobs. Talk to you tomorrow, folks. They knew that change was going to come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up